we want to make sure that we're absorbing our fat. And we have gotten so far into these that we shouldn't eat fat, we don't need fat, but we really need fat. And our cell walls need fat. For our hormones, we need fat. You know, the backbone of our hormones is cholesterol. We need that digestion in order to absorb our fat so that our body can utilize them, which is gonna play a big role in healing our skin. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome to episode number 50 of the Healthy Skin Show. Can you believe it? We are already at episode number 50, and it is incredible that we've gotten this far and we've got so much amazing content still to come your way. One thing I love about this podcast and about this show is that you guys are such an integral part of the community and the process. You help tell us what you want to hear about. You ask questions actively. You get in touch with us when you're like, hey, um, I want to learn more about this. Or can you find somebody to speak on this particular issue because I haven't heard about it? So I love that we've got so much interaction and I deeply appreciate that. And it's driven us to look harder and ask better questions. So thank you so much for being an active and engaged listener and also for sharing this with your friends, your family, and with other people you believe really need to hear something outside of the conventional way of thinking about rashes. Like, here, use this cream, take this pill. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. So we're looking at this from a completely different way and sharing this with others who need some level of hope to look at their skin from that new perspective, it means a lot to me and I really appreciate it. I wanted to share quickly before we dive into today's episode and actually a listener's question, we've got a great review from a new listener who found the show and I wanted to share it. It's over on iTunes from Tree C. So wow, I've listened to a couple of the podcasts and am totally stoked. Finally, it seems, a place to get true information and help. I have rosacea and will be looking forward to learning about ways to manage and hopefully rid myself of this horrible condition. By the way, I loved the B podcast. I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate you spending the time going on rating and reviewing the podcast, and I hope that we will have other episodes that will also inspire you just as much. And of course, if you haven't done so yet, your ratings and reviews actually mean a ton to helping get this show out there. So if you haven't done that yet, head on over to your platform of choice where you listen to The Healthy Skin Show and leave us a review and or rate the podcast. And of course, I'm going to go into a listener's question, but if you've got a question, burning question, it can be something about your skin, about specific products, about something you heard online, or just a burning question where you're like, I'd love to get Jen's two cents. Head on over to HealthySkinShow.com, scroll down just a tad underneath the player, and you can submit a voicemail question on anything, whether it's nutrition, skin, gut issues, pretty much anything that's pertaining to your skin and your skin conditions or your symptoms. So head on over and do that. We love those questions. We take every single one and put them into a queue so that we can get your questions answered. All right. So today I want to take a question from a listener named Holly. Hi, Jennifer. My daughter is four years old and has had keratosis polaris since she was a baby. It is mainly on her arms, but sometimes appears on her thighs and even cheeks. Is there anything I can do to help her skin? And more importantly, should I be looking for possible triggers in her diet? Thanks. Thank you so much, Holly, for taking the time to submit this question. I know as a parent, it can be so frustrating when you're seeing your child deal with something, whether they're really suffering with a condition or there's just some underlying annoyance there. And you're like, you know, I'd really like to figure this out, but I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Here's the thing with keratosis pilaris, and I've actually answered this question a few times, but not from the perspective of a child. So keep in mind that there is other information in some of the other episodes about keratosis pilaris in general. Now, 
This skin condition, no matter whether it occurs in adults or kids, is due to a vitamin A deficiency. In fact, one could argue, at least from my master's degree program, it was considered a physical sign of a vitamin A deficiency. So when someone comes to me and has checked that box off, right there I'm like, ooh, we've got to look at their vitamin A levels. So this is not a reaction to food. I can understand where you're coming from with that. However, it's not some food that your child is reacting to, assuming that the diagnosis is correct. And I'm not a doctor, so I'm hoping that you've brought your child to a pediatrician and had them take a look at these skin rashes to confirm if that is in fact the case. So if keratosis pilaris is what's happening, this is due to low levels of vitamin A. We don't make vitamin A. You have to have a constant supply of that coming into your system. So the question is, what's your child eating? If your child is eating a lot of processed foods um, or a lot of starchy carbs, which sometimes can happen in young children, that may be a reason for a lack of this very important fat-soluble vitamin. It may not be available to the child in the foods that they're consuming. It's also possible that they could have a problem absorbing it. And sometimes that happens when a child or even an adult's digestive system is not super happy. Sometimes we'll see where fat-soluble vitamins get kicked out because there's so much inflammation in the gut. And that can happen to young children and even babies, depending on what's going on in their microbiome, their digestive function, a whole bunch of different factors. So keep in mind here that there's no food that's underlying this and causing it. It's just a lack of either vitamin A in the diet or a lack of absorption of the vitamin A that is in your child's diet. Now, it's important with any fat-soluble vitamin, but especially with vitamin A, that you have a baseline level of what is available in the blood of your child or even yourself if you're an adult listening. I wouldn't recommend that you just start supplementing with vitamin A. And I know some people say, well, if I do like a natural form like cod liver oil or liver or any number of things, um, I should be fine. Well, that's all well and good, but you can end up with excessive vitamin A and there are actual symptoms um, that can result in having too much vitamin A in your system. So it's best to go speak, especially in this case with a child or a baby, go speak to the doctor Have them run a lab. They can easily test the vitamin A levels in the child's blood, the serum vitamin A level, and find out where you are before you start supplementing. And the doctor or a nutritionist, such as Jennifer Brand, who's been on the show, who specifically work with young children and babies, they can give you a really good sense of how much is appropriate to supplement. Because the amount that you would supplement as an adult is not the same for children and young babies. They're much smaller and typically require less. However, that is not my area of expertise. So speaking of diving into child and baby needs as far as skin rashes and eczema is concerned, today's guest is going to talk a bunch about that. Thank you so much to my guests for being on the show. I know you guys are going to love this, but let's dive into that interview with Dr. Sheila Kilbane. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Healthy Skin Show. Today's guest, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about kids and babies. So many of you have asked me for someone to come on and speak directly to this. And I found what, whom I feel is the right person to talk to. Her name is Dr. Sheila Kilbane. She is a board-certified pediatrician who trained with Dr. Andrew Weil, the famous Dr. Andrew Weil, in integrative medicine. She works with families to find the root cause of illness and uses natural and nutritional therapies whenever possible. Her mission is to transform pediatric health care globally in order to get one million kids off of meds that they may not need. That is a very, very powerful goal that I hope to support, and I'm glad to have her here. Dr. Kilbane sees patients in her clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina, and helps people all over the world through her online education courses. She's also the author of the Amazon bestseller, Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, a step-by-step guide to improving many common childhood illnesses. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Oh my gosh. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm super excited to share today. (laughs) Well, you know, like I was saying, I get a lot of questions about kids. And funny enough, as I was sharing with you before the interview started, Dr. Aaron, who is, I think, episode number four, is who connected us, which I'm so yes. grateful for him. And for those of you who are listening, if, you have, if you're not familiar with Dr. Aaron or you missed that episode, head back over and we'll put it in the show notes. But let's talk about kids and babies today. I, I feel like a lot of times we make the assumption that what works in adults is going to work in children and babies. And so... When you first see a child in your practice, for example, and they're struggling with eczema and these awful skin issues, what do you think are the first things that we should consider that might not be considered in a conventional dermatology office? Yeah, so I always talk about illnesses, whether it's eczema, asthma, no matter what it is, is that we have to look at the triggers of inflammation. And so there are a few things that really we, we miss in our conventional medical training. So when it comes to eczema, so the first thing is food. So we know, and this is in, you know, well-researched that anywhere from a third to two thirds of eczema can be triggered by a food sensitivity or a food allergy. The two big culprits are dairy and eggs. And so that's, that's one area. And again, it doesn't always mean that eczema is triggered by those. It just means that we need to look at that. And it, it can be other foods as well. And in my experience, it's often more than one food. But we always start with dairy because that is just the predominant one. So the second thing is we have to look at environmental allergies. We need to, dust mites can be a big trigger for eczema, You know, we just need, and I do that through blood work. You can do it through skin prick testing. There are, you know, a couple different ways you can do it. So we want to look at environmental allergies. Then we want to look at other environmental issues. We can have things like mold exposure, and that's typically the kind of toxic mold that will grow in water-damaged buildings. So that's going to be lower, but we always, like, if you've done everything that you can think of from the conventional and integrative world, then... That's when my mind always goes to, we need to check them for toxic mold exposure. And then the last component is the the content of the skin. So the bacterial content of the skin. We know that kids and adults with eczema have a higher bacterial content on their skin. And they'll have a staph, in particular staph. And this staph produces a delta toxin. And this is where Dr. Aaron's regimen comes into play. And I actually learned about Dr. Aaron from one of the mothers in my practice. And her little boy, just terrible case of eczema. They were doing a perfect diet. We had really gone through all of the triggers. And she found Dr. Aaron online and started using his topical. And her little boy was also getting recurrent MRSA boils. So the methicillin-resistant staph aureus. And the Dr. Aaron cream really helped in addition to the food and the other things were in the supplements, that topical allowed us to bring the staph count on his skin and that really helped him turn the corner. And it also, you know, it can take about 90 days for the full thickness of that, the skin to heal. And so we want to address each area. So we want to look at the gut. But then we also want to make sure that we're treating the skin and we want to do it for a period of time so that we're really getting that full healing. Mm. And that's an important thing, too, in managing someone's expectations, because I found that people sometimes think that it's going to take a week or two weeks. For a month. And I even shared, I mean, granted, I was not a child when I had eczema, but even my own journey, it really took six months yeah. for my skin to calm itself down and stop flaring up. So it's important to have that type of mentality. It's like, okay, I've got to go into this knowing that there's going to be at least this three month period where we're doing a lot of work here. Absolutely. And it's, it's all when, because in the integrative world, I'm looking at all of those aspects and the gut health. And so it can take, I always describe gut healing the same way as we heal a sprained ankle. So a sprained ankle or a jammed finger, it can take a good three to six months until that joint feels like your own joint again. 
And so we're doing with the gut exactly what we're doing as we rehab an ankle. And it's just over time that inflammation is going to go down. But it's also, we usually find the course goes three steps forward, one or two steps backward, three steps forward, one or two steps backward until we get to that, you know, ideally that full resolution. But we can have triggers along the way. And there are so many different things that can trigger, but it's typically once we get the really the skin intact and the gut healed, that's when those small triggers don't throw us off and we don't end up all night scratching or getting a big flare up. Or maybe, you know, maybe when you get exposed to something that's your trigger, you just get a little bit of a flare up. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And you actually made an interesting point about saying you know, we've got to really work on the gut, which is something that I absolutely 100% believe in and also do in my practice with adults. So here's the thing with kids, though. Kids are different. Babies are different than adults. It's not my wheelhouse, but it is yours. So can you share with us a little bit for the moms that are listening to this, or the grandmoms, or the aunts or uncles, whomever is listening to this, like knowing that they have a child or a baby in the family, It's really struggling with this, but maybe the parent is very interested in going a more natural route and they're doing a lot of research online. This is always what I see. They're doing a lot of research and they're like, well, I found this online that this helped this, you know, it's this person, but the person happens to be an adult. Yeah. And they'll say, do you think I should try this? And I'm like, you really need to work with a practitioner because babies and children are different. So can you speak to that, you know? What do you have to what do you have to keep in mind when you are working on a child's gut? How would it differ from adults in areas that maybe parents don't realize? Yeah. And I'll what I think would be the most helpful, I can walk you through exactly what I do. And it's my online course does this in more detail, but I really I talk a lot about doing one thing at a time so that we know what's helping and what's not. I treat supplements just like I treat a medication. We do it we do them one at a time for 5 days at a time before adding another one in. When it comes to the foods, we always remove one thing at a time. And in the adult world, often people will, you know, have an adult take the full elimination, you know, do everything, go off of all the top allergens at one time, but with kids, it's just it's so hard to do that. And then we're, we're not getting the nutrients sometimes that we need if we're going on a really strict elimination diet. Again, sometimes that is, sometimes we do that, but we do it for limited periods of time. But I always, we start off removing dairy and we do it a, a week. At, so we do it from breakfast for a week, then keep it out of breakfast and remove it from lunch. Then the third week we move it, remove it from dinner and snacks because with kids, if you, Stop dairy cold turkey. Sometimes they can get worse before they get better because they almost have a withdrawal type effect and they will get irritable. They might get have trouble sleeping. You'll see mood swings up and down. And that's just, you know, that's a whole nother three hours. We could talk about the opiate like effect and things like that. So I do that gradually. But while we're doing that, then we begin to get supplements added. And so the I'm always thinking and talking to parents about gut function. So it's not necessarily about adding a whole bunch of supplements, but we need the GI tract to move because the bile from the gallbladder is going to do more to balance out the bacteria in our small intestine, in our colon than any supplement we could ever do. And the thing that gets the bile moving are bitter foods. And we just don't eat bitter things in this country. You know, a lot of other countries, they have you know, kimchi, they have fermented foods, they eat bitter foods. So we just little bits at a time, even squeezing a little lemon in water, you can do that. But what what I do then is I start a probiotic, we do that for five days. And I usually will start with a really mild single strain low dose probiotic. And then we move on to digestive enzymes. And then after that, we talk about omega three fats and phosphatidylcholine, which, you know, omega three fats are what you get in, you know, cold water fish like salmon, um, get it in chia seed, flaxseed, hemp seed. And then phosphatidylcholine is something that you get in the yolk of eggs. And all of these things make up cell walls. So what we really focus on is we need to make healthy cell walls. 
Because once we have a healthy cell wall, whether it's our GI tract or our skin, that's what's going to give bring return that function. And that's what's going to return that elasticity and really get that integrity of the skin to where it's that smooth, you know, it's a nice barrier. Our skin is a big barrier. And so we want to restore cellular function and the health of the cell wall. So that's, so we walk through that way. And then, you know, after the three weeks of being off dairy, we see where we are. Then we decide, okay, do we still, do we need to take eggs out? Okay, maybe, maybe not. Then we go through that process and we gradually, with the other foods, with eggs and some of the other foods, you don't have to go as slowly. But with gluten and dairy, I always at least take three weeks to wean the kids off of it so that we don't have the sort of those downturns and those, the, the moodiness and irritability. Yeah. Correct. And I really, I prefer if you don't know exactly what you're doing with supplements, I actually prefer that you don't do them because you can do all of this. You know, you could add a little bit of fermented food, you know, an organic sauerkraut, for example, and you could give a child a fourth of a teaspoon or half of a teaspoon of the liquid from a fermented sauerkraut. But you also want to know the difference between fermenting and pickling. So we don't, a fermented food isn't going to have vinegar in it. So we just want to be careful there. But the, with supplements, I, I rarely actually use the pediatric based supplements because most of them have so many additives to make them taste good. So like the supplement, I mean, I'm happy to share brands and things. I, I'm not sure how you prefer on your show. Um, but we like this, the, the probiotic that I use, it's a, it, the species is a lactobacillus plantarum. It's a soil based. It's a very robust species and it's very pure. It doesn't actually have any of the fructo oligosaccharide or the inulin in it because for a lot of the patients I see, their guts are so sensitive that that can cause bloating and gassiness. But the species is robust enough that it survives, you know, the, the packaging and sitting on a shelf and things like that. So we just open up the capsule and we'll give it, you know, we give it to babies, we give it for any age, but we're using a really good pure product. And then same thing with our digestive enzymes. And it's, there's, again, I don't, I'm happy to share the company that we use. Okay. So it's a, it's a company called Transformation Enzymes and the probiotic is called Planodophilus. And then the digestive enzymes are... There, the company, there's a, a capsule, there's a chewable, and there's a powder. So it comes in every different form, you know, for, for babies versus, you know, older kids to, onto adults of however you, you know, some adults will take the chewables. And again, it goes back to restoring gut function because the other thing that is so important to skin health to our, you know, brain function is we want to make sure that we're absorbing our fats. And we have gotten so far into these that we shouldn't eat fat, we don't need fat, but we really need fat. And our cell walls need fat. For our hormones, we need fat. You know, the, the backbone of our hormones is cholesterol. And we need that digestion in order to absorb, to absorb our fat so that our body can utilize them, which is going to play a big role in healing our skin. Absolutely. And so one other point, and I'd mentioned this before we started, was just about your thoughts on essential oils. I've had a lot of moms who love essential oils. They use them in their home and they're wonderful for many different things. But then there's this thought of applying the essential oils directly to the skin of their children and their babies because they have rashes and things. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share to moms who have are considering doing this or are doing this right now? Yes. So I don't use essential oils at the beginning. I don't. And I essential oils are something that you really need to know what you're doing before applying them, especially with kids, because you can have some have side effects and your, your kids can react to the essential oils. So we really my preference is to get the skin, you know, as clear as we can get it. And then if we want to use a couple of things, if you want, we want to use a little bit of lavender diffused at nighttime for calming, but I don't utilize essential oils for healing in terms of eczema. 
And two, you just have to also have to be careful about what you apply in general, because some I know with babies and young children, things like the menthol based essential oils like peppermint and such, those can actually have a toxicity in children. Peppermint, oregano, yeah, tea tree oil, you can have some side effects also. So you, you we really want to be careful. And they can also, like, if you're pl- applying an oil directly to the skin and you have a lot of staph bacteria, that actually creates a little layer and that staph can proliferate. So it, it can make things worse. And that's why, again, I always go back to let's get the skin healed. And then if we want to use some essential oils, For other things, we can do that. That's great. And then do you ever recommend like uh, oatmeal baths or any type of soaks that maybe parents should look into or try if they've got a child that's really uncomfortable? We talk about baths in the way of it doesn't have to be super fancy. We can do some Epsom salt baths. You know, you can put a little baking soda in the bath. But I I also, we just use soap on the critical areas. You don't necessarily have to get a lot of soap but you want to use something mild. And I I still, Dove soap can be one of the mildest things that we can use. And it's not, I'd rather an organic soap if families, you know, have access to getting a nice organic soap. But if you need something just inexpensive, I would just use that, you know, the sensitive one. And again, just soap up the critical areas and you don't have to do a lot of washing of the other parts of the body. That's what I always say. (laughs) so true it's so true because it 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 really does you lose that i think in general you lose the sense of moisture throughout the skin you're also your skin area there are dry parts of the skin naturally they're drier than other areas so you're just further drying them out and it can cause increased irritation and that's in my adult skin but yeah i would imagine in young children and babies it would still apply But um, this has been really enlightening, and I hope that maybe sometime we can drill down more. I'm sure parents are going to have more questions after this. So perhaps, perhaps if you have the time, you'll be able to come back and join us again for another interview. Would would you be open to that? Yes, absolutely. I I love what you're doing, and eczema is just so near and dear to my heart, and there's so much that we can do about it. And I, we, I think you and I agree on this. I don't, I don't like kids to suffer from this. Yeah. The pictures on the Facebook groups I'm in, they like make me want to cry. Like it is mm. no child. I mean, no one should have to suffer, but a child, like that is horrible. The first years of your life. And that's what you're experiencing. I, I just can't even imagine. And I I wish there was some way we could just erase that suffering out of the world. And so I'm so glad that we get the opportunity to do this and help all the moms out there and grandmoms and everybody else that's rallying for for these little children. Um, Absolutely. And and so I just want to share, too, you've got on your website, and I'm going to put links to all of this stuff in the show notes for today's episode. You've got this great free download Uh, 10 tips to use food as your pharmacy, which is a really great freebie for everybody to go grab. And then don't forget, we've got this great book over on Amazon, Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, a step-by-step guide to improving many common childhood illnesses. Anything else you'd like to share as a final thought? I'll also give you a link to my online course that people can can join and that I go through everything step by step and exactly how I do it in my practice. And I think that's everything, but just know that you can keep, just just stick with it. It takes a little bit of time, but every I, we just see incredible results when we when we couple, you know, the, some of the conventional treatments along with the integrative and we can have an incredible results. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone, please go check out Dr. Kilbane at SheilaKilbane.com. She's got a Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channel that you can go connect with her. And I will make sure to put everything in the show notes so that it's easy for you to find. I truly hope that this episode was eye-opening and enlightening, especially for those of you who tune in and have little ones that you're trying to care for who've got these chronic skin rashes. It breaks my heart when I'm in Facebook groups and I 
see the pictures of babies and children who are suffering and not that us adults deserve it any more or less, but it just makes me sad to think that these young ones start out their life at the beginning of their life experience. Something that's so incredibly stressful can be very painful and highly traumatic as well. So anything that we can do to help support you moms and dads out there trying to help your kids, I'm happy to connect you with those guests. And I deeply appreciate everything that Dr. Kilbane brings to the table. Now, if you guys can rate and review the Healthy Skin Show on whatever podcast platform you're tuning in on, and please share this episode with those moms and dads out there that are looking for answers and trying to figure things out from a more holistic perspective, but might not know where to turn and could end up in a very sticky situation, their kids are really unhappy when they start doing things that they're not 100% sure are the best steps for them. I hope that the advice shared here will really aid them and you along your journey. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.